unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Gospel of Matthew chapter 26 verses 37. Matthew chapter 26 verses 37. It's a time when Jesus Christ is toward the last days of his life. And so one of those days he takes Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful. The Bible says he was very heavy hearted. And then he saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. He had a sorrow in his heart. There was too much sorrow. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, 100% God, was full of exceeding sorrow in his heart because of the impending predicament that was coming through. So he tells them, Carry ye here and watch with me. He tells them, Watch with me. And he went a little farther and fell on his feet, the Bible says, and prayed, saying, O Father, if it be possible, he said, let this cup pass from me. The Bible says, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. And then he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and says unto Peter, what, could you not watch with me one hour? Couldn't you just watch with me for one hour? And the Bible says in 41, he says, watch and pray that she enter not into temptation. The spirit, he said, is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. The Bible says, went again the second time and prayed, O oh, Father, if it be possible, pass this from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes again were heavy. And he left them and went away and prayed the third time, saying the same words. And then cometh he to his disciples and says unto them, Sleep or now, the Bible says, and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. This uh, was a time when Jesus Christ, of course, is about to be betrayed and taken to the cross. He is full of anguish in his heart. He gets the sons of Zebedee and Peter and says, pray with me. You know, watch and pray. Watch, watch with me. It goes away, comes first, second time, third time. They're asleep every time. And then he says something in 41. And he tells them, look, for the spirit, he said, is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. He spoke of the weakness of the flesh. Now, today, I felt the need to teach about what it means to watch. Okay? To watch. Because when you read from the 41st verse, the 26th chapter of Matthew. The Bible says, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Watch and pray. Okay. Uh, of course, we are teaching people how to pray. We have told how to pray. I have told how to pray. I have quite a number of them. If you go on the mobile app, you'll find them. I have taught what we call prayer calls. All right. And the reason why I taught about prayer calls is because we need to empower people to learn to pray because the Bible says you ask and receive not because you ask amiss. Some people do not receive because they do not know how to pray. If you just don't know how to pray. Okay? And now Jesus adds another ingredient in this conversation and says that watch and pray. Okay? He says when you watch and pray, you will not enter into temptation for your spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. He's trying to tell us a battle that really goes through our carnality, fleshly nature, versing our spiritual, divine nature, okay? The Bible says that the spirit is an enemy of the flesh, and the flesh is an enemy to the spirit. These two are against each other, and one has to override the other. If you live by the flesh, if you submit your spirit to your fleshly, carnal nature, the Bible says you shall surely die. But if you buy the spirit, the Bible says, kill the transactions of your body. Romans says, the Bible says, you shall live, 8.13. So we, through the spirit, the Bible says, mortify the deeds of the body. And it's through that that we live. It's through that that we live. So today, I wanted to talk about what it means to watch. Okay? 
you have heard through scriptures, watchmen, who is a watchman. What does it mean to be a watchman? Isaiah says, I have appointed watchmen over Israel, you know, and over Jerusalem, you know, that they should stand and their walls would not fall. So we've had experiences in scripture all the way back in olden history where we have seen this conversation of watchmen, people that are watching over cities, people that are watching over places, people that are watching over things. And then that has transitioned into the New Testament dispensation. Of course, people have spoken about watchers in the Old Testament, watchmen. Uh, but when we come to the New Testament, it's a conversation that not many places in church is spoken, is heard. And so many people do not understand what it means to watch. Okay, yet Christ told us to watch and pray. You know, your prayer life cannot be complete if you are not watching. Okay, we are going through a very uh, sensitive period as a world, as a nation, and nations across the world. You have heard of this impediment of virus that has hit the world so badly and paralyzed economies by the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands have been lost to this disease and, you know, borders have been closed and, you know, poverty has stricken homes, institutions have closed, businesses have, you know, shifted their models into working home, um, ministries and churches have been stopped and we do not know how long we're going to go through this and for a moment imagine what's the post-COVID church going to look like, you know, is it going to be a congregative one or is it not? There are many questions in the hearts of many believers and pastors and ministers across the world. But in this period, many people, like I said in one of the previous sermons, have not taken time to invest in prayer and waiting and watching to see what God is up to. That's why I send a stunning warning to believers out there that if we do not take this time so sensitively to seek God on exactly what he is telling us, as a body of Christ, us as a church, us as a world, after COVID, and which will be, of course, many people might not have function. Many people might not have the due relevance of the hour and the time. Ministers, pastors, believers, people out there that now have a call on their lives and have a responsibility to this world. More than ever before, our hearts are supposed to be attuned and our mind and attention towards God in what he's seeking to do. We must be watching. We must be able to discern the different signs of the Spirit and what they imply without necessarily entertaining conspiracies that have no end or that are baseless or that are driven by the fear of others because fear brings torment and that fear sort of brings bondage and some conspiracies indeed are leading the church, the body of Christ to bondage. But by and large, I believe that this is going to pass. I believe that we have a greater glory. But to see that we have a greater glory to know that we have a greater glory is one thing, but for you to be a participant, for you to be a partaker of that experience, and for you to be an active voice and a pioneer in the next move of the Spirit that is coming, it is incumbent on you to position yourself and to watch. To watch, you know, because we can pray, but many of us are not attuned to watching. So I want to teach you what it means to watch. And firstly, let me give this disclaimer. In the New Testament dispensation, Christ has given us a different idea of watching as it was from the Old, okay? In the Old Testament dispensation, when you are talking about watchmen, you are talking about people with a prophetic unction, you know, the voice that was set for the leading of the congregation in the Old Testament dispensation, okay? Because the anointings were clear. The major three were kingly, they were priestly, and prophets, all right? So you needed watchmen. So the watchmen anointing in the Old Testament dispensation was a very prophetic inclination, okay? And so not many were gifted in that office and not all could claim to be watchmen over nations or over communities, over people, over events and affairs. How be it when it comes in the New Testament church, to watch is the responsibility of every believer, okay? To watch is the responsibility of the church general. All right? When Jesus says in Matthew 26, 41, when he says, watch and pray, he did not say, ye apostles, or ye pastors, or ye evangelists, or ye prophets. No. That was a general instruction, you know, to the men of that hour. And it's not actually 
proven even in scripture in the gospel that we had claimed that Peter was a prophet of the sons of Zebedee, you know, but it was a general line to the people that were available and acquainted to his heart in that hour. So watching in the New Testament dispensation is for the church. It's general. Every believer must be a watchman. Every believer must be hosted to something to watch for the generation and the hour in the mighty name of Jesus. So now let's go deeper and, and start to define what it means to watch, okay? The Hebrew word is shaumao, okay? And the Greek word is gregoreo, right? Now, these words, they mean to be spiritually conscious, okay? They mean to be active and attentive. They mean to say that you must be alert, you know, spiritually. To watch means you have to be alert spiritually. But what is the end of watching? In watching, the reason why we talk about that is to take heed, lift through in any form of remission and indolence or irresponsibility and lack of order. Destruction can come over you. Calamity can befall you or befall people, befall a generation, befall a dispensation if you have not watched. So watching really is sort of a pre convenient grace affair. It's sort of uh, in the realms of sunesis, the critical faculty in the spirit of a man that designs things way prior to their coming so the man would devise means of how to avert, to deal, to stand, you know, to quench whatever affairs come through. Uh, I don't know whether I'm understood there. Because, you know, many are the afflictions of the righteous. You know, attacks come from left, right, and center. But if a man does not know how to position themselves spiritually in a place where they can see they are alert and conscious spiritually enough, it means that through that, uh, that irresponsibility, that insolence, okay, could lead to destruction, could lead to calamity, uh, could lead to a sudden overtake of that individual, and then defeat is imminent, all right? And so we need to be connected to the spirit enough to know what God requires of us in that time. And sometimes it can begin from a personal perspective. But like all things of God, they never end with the individual. It always goes into your family. It goes into your businesses. It goes into your children. It goes into your ministry. It goes into your community. It goes into the district. It goes into the nation. It goes into, you know, the continent. It goes into the world. Because all of these levels, okay, of responsibility carry altars as well. And you cannot light an altar of prayer, whether from a family perspective or a community perspective or a church perspective or a national perspective or a continent perspective or a world perspective. No altar carries a completion without a watcher, without watchmen. So God has called you and I to watch and pray because he's saying the only reason why we are tempted from the spiritual into carnality, the only reason why we are losing spiritual battles to physical experiences is because we have not exercised ourselves in the watching and praying. Now, COVID is across the world. Disease is scattered across the world. And God, in his infinite wisdom, knew that you who is listening to me and me right now would be available and alive in this hour. Do not be mistaken for one minute that God doesn't see the end or that there is no you know, greater end to this. There's going to be a greater end to this. Okay? But are we watching? Are we actively involved in the consciousness of the spirit, in the alertness of the spirit, okay, to know what God is up to, to connect to what God is up to, to be attuned to what God is up to? Because what people are calling lockdown in the church, we're calling it waiting on God. We're calling it meditating. We're calling it a period of prayer. We're calling it a period of sanctification. You know, we are calling it a period of consecration. It's a period of consecration for what is coming. So yes, some of you are struggling, oh, we're in lockdown, oh, we're in lockdown. That's what, of course, the world will see. But this is a great opportunity for the Christian because I feel some of us were running, or many of us were actually running at speeds that were starting to lose, you know, the voice of God, and we had started to disconnect from the affairs of the Spirit. And they feel more than ever before, as we lock ourselves up in our home, God desires that attention. 
And he's speaking a lot in this space. He's speaking a lot in this time. He's saying a lot. I feel more than ever before we are right for the next move of the Spirit. Men have prophesied it. We have waited for it for a long time. But I feel more than ever before we are waiting, we are anticipating for the next move of the Spirit. And it's going to come so off guard that not many people are going to be able to connect to it quickly. Some of them will want to but it will depend on how quick or how fast they will catch up to the move because when the winds blow and they're blowing a certain direction like they are in this period, the most alert, you know, it's like the locusts. Locusts are blown by wind, but they need to be facing a certain direction when the wind comes, all right? And so that's what I'm trying to tell us, that if for those of them who are going to be facing in the direction where the wind will be blowing, many of us will have a more clearer vision of what is coming ahead. And I tell people there is nothing to fear touching our future. There is nothing to fear touching the next months and years that are coming ahead of us. All things are working together for good for them that love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. But are we watching? Are we attuned to the watching of the hour? Are we connected to God's watching? Are we active and conscious in the spirit? Are we alert, you know? Because if we are not, then certain things will come and overtake you. Some things will overtake if you don't learn to be a watcher, okay? This period has swallowed many businesses. This period has swallowed many jobs. This period has swallowed many ministries. And some, after COVID, might not run again, you know? It has swallowed many affairs. Some people are indebted with banks and even in coming through, some are going to begin their businesses from negative and they might want to borrow from banks that are not willing. You know, this season is overtaking many. But to stay afloat, you must be watching because when you watch, you carry the understanding for what to do and the way to do it in the next page of where we're going. I want to read something for us in Revelation chapter 16, I believe, verses 15. Uh, because when we are talking about watchers, what are we talking about? What are we defining? Okay, You know, to watch in the Old Testament, for example, they were talking about watchmen, and you'd see they would watch over vineyards. You'd see they would watch over the safety of fields, so they would safeguard fields and vineyards. And when I'm talking about vineyards, when I'm talking about fields for the New Testament believer, for me as a pastor, I know that there is a responsibility of my underguarding and safeguarding of the sheep, uh, the folk, that God has, you know, given to me for responsibility in humility to serve them, but to make sure that they are fed, to make sure that they are tended, to make sure that they are looked after, that after this period, they'll come out greater, they'll come out stronger, they'll come out better, okay? For some people, their vineyard is their business. For some people, their vineyard is their family. For some people, their vineyard is their career. For some people... Their vineyard is their political affair, whichever it is, okay? And, of course, it goes from that bigger picture to even the individuals. In Hebrews 13, 17, you've heard of the experience of watching over men. He says, obey them that have the rule over you, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account. They watch for your souls as they that must give account that you may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. When God calls all of us as believers. He gives us men to watch over us. So yes, much as we're watching over our own affairs, our ministries, and all this, I have men who watch over me. You have a man or a person who watches over you, and everyone should actually have somebody watching over them. It doesn't matter whether you're a prophet, a pastor, a teacher, an evangelist. When you get to a point where the man is not watched over, there's a space where that man, whether it's 10, 20 years, 15 years, that man will cease to profit. Because it's a law, it's a principle that God has set in the world. It's the law, it's one of those basic laws that define the sustaining of our increases and multiplication. And I hope somebody caught that. Now, in Revelation 16, uh, 15, there's a conversation that is also brought to our thoughts that I want to carry on because it goes even beyond the watching, okay? He goes deeper. He says, behold, I come as a thief. He says, Blessed is he, the Bible says, that watcheth, Omar, and keepeth his garments. The Bible says, least he walk naked. The Bible says, and they see his clothing. Least he walk naked, and they see his clothing. Now, the reason why I want to bring this conversation here is that in more than just watching, 
Okay. There's another introduction of another responsibility in there, which is to keep your garments. There's another responsibility in there, which is to keep your garments. Some of you who are watching me right now have probably, for example, had dreams, strange dreams. Many men and believers out there have started or have spread a teaching out there in the world touching the interpretation of dreams, but when you hear it, it is like the dream interpreters of the world, okay? It's like the fortune tellers, the tarot card readers and palm readers. It's like the dream interpreters of the world that are not guided at all by the Spirit of God, but by darkness, okay? I have sat around believers for so many years and have been so, you know, dismayed in hearing how certain dreams are interpreted. And some people, because they do not know how to interpret dreams, many of them have hit shipwreck and have been destroyed, okay? Some uh, have destroyed their own lives, their families, their relationships, their businesses. There are couples right now that are separated and divorced because of dreams. There are children that are separated from their parents right now because of dreams. There are partners that are no longer working together in business because of dreams. There are sons that are disconnected from ministries they're supposed to be connected to because of dreams. There are fathers that are disconnected from sons because of dreams and because of the false interpretation of dreams that is out there. It is so sad and paining. Because firstly, not all dreams are from God. Not all dreams are from God. Okay? And sometimes, even before we teach what these dreams are or how to design, we need to firstly help people separate dreams from light, the light of the glorious gospel, and dreams of darkness, okay, and from Satan, all right? Some dreams come in, like to warn, the Bible says, while men are asleep, he opens their ears and seals their instruction that he might rob man of purpose and pride, okay? But the Bible says there are also instances where people have dreamt simply by, you know, the multitude of affairs and eating too much food and because of too much thought that you've had during this, sometimes you go to bed and sleep and dream of something, an activity or an event that is attached to the thing that has uh, consumed your mind, you know. For the Bible says, for a dream comes through a multitude of business. And so sometimes some people are so involved in many things that some dreams they have are connected to the events and affairs they've been having of that season and the day, and they actually think, oh, this is probably a dream from God, a sign from God, or a dream, you know, from that. But some of them are simply basic dreams, your brain is simply responding to experiences that you've gone through. And some people take every dream as literal. They take every dream as is, okay? And they don't know yet anymore to tell the difference between darkness and light, between God and the devil when it comes to, you know, divine instruction. And some have actually been instructed by the devil in dreams. Remember, Satan transformed himself even as an angel of light, okay? Second Corinthians 11.4. Satan, no marvel, transformed himself into an angel of light. So it's possible for Satan to come in a form of light even in your dream and dissuade you. And so I tell people, be very careful when it comes to dream and to study more to understand because today I hear things and I even shudder to think how certain people see life. But I was saying, for example, one of the primary principles of interpretation of dreams, the Bible says the dream comes with its meaning. It comes with its meaning. Usually when God gives you a dream, the meaning of that dream is not usually far from the events that you have seen. Okay? One time somebody sent me a video clip, and it's so sad how far we have gone in interpreting dreams. One time I was watching a clip of a minister, whose name I will not mention on ministry because it's not right to. And this fellow was teaching about dreams. And then he said, some of you, if you dream of a mango, I like you hear the word mango, it's man go, this preacher said. It means that as a man, you're going somewhere. <laughs> huh? So somebody dreams of a mango, and so this guy cuts the word short, man go, and he said it means as a man, you're going somewhere. That's so crazy. That's so sick. It's so far, so far from reality and truth. But hey, you know, what would you say if he's an authority? in the life of some individuals. Again, fruit, fruit. The Bible says you shall know them by their fruit. 
Although even if you talk about fruit, not many people can actually design fruit. You know, many times we say you shall know men by their fruit, but not many people have the wisdom to design fruit. Don't think that fruit is easily designable. You understand? There are people that are eating meat, the Bible says, that satisfieth not, like the scriptures say. But in the time of eating meat, all right, somebody can say, wow, you see, that is the fruit of their face. Now they're eating meat. Okay? There are people that are putting on raiment that is not for their feeding. But because there's provision, okay, there's a fixation in this provision that now they can put on raiment on their body. So they think, hmm, I think this is the fruit of me having joined this church. This is the fruit, the result of me having left this ministry and gone to sit under the other ministry. I think that is why I bought a car. That's the fruit that they are result. Some people are so misguided, so misguided that they do not design fruit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? What is the fruit of the Spirit? Yeah, because many times when we talk about fruit, we're talking about so many, you know, physical things. We're talking about, you know, physical events and, and affairs. But what is the fruit of the Spirit? Have you been perfected in love? Or firstly, love? Have you been filled with the joy of the Spirit? Do you really have peace? Or you act in other sort of peace? Are you long-suffering? Is there gentleness in your spirit? Is there goodness? Have you been elevated in faith? Okay. Is there meekness in your spirit? Or you became more abusive? Or you became more irritable? Or you became more angry? Is there temperance in your spirit? Is there self-control? Because you see, the fulfillment of the judgment of fruit, it says against these, the Bible says there is no law. All right? There is no law. In that place, uh, you see the seamless working of the Spirit of God in your life with no effort. And at least if you're suited under a minister or a preacher who produces fruit, even if things around you have not changed, you'll bear one witness that every time that man speaks, every time that woman speaks, something in me is released. I might not have seen yet the outward manifestation of that, but there's something inside there. You know, there's something inside there that releases me into a rest, that releases grace into my spirit and not the law that would kill, the letter that would kill me. That, that for me, is the standard. And when we go deeper into designing fruit, not many people have matured, you know, to design that. But back to Revelation, there's another conversation here. He's saying, I come as a thief, he says, and blessed is he that watcheth, Omar, and keepeth his garments, the Bible says, least he walk naked and they see his nakedness. So some of you have had visions or dreams, and in the dream you're naked. Okay? Not necessarily a perverse nakedness. All right? Some people, you know, have dreams when they're naked, but that nakedness is going to be a perversion, you know, of any sort. But some people simply dream when they're walking naked or they're naked or have visions of people when they're naked or you have a vision of people when they're naked. This is the thing I'm, I'm trying to talk about. Why would God allow you to see yourself naked in a dream, all right, or to see yourself naked, particularly in a dream? What is this nakedness? And that's why he's talking about that in Revelation 16, uh, 15. He says, least he walk naked and they see his shame, all right? Because number one, when you are dealing with nakedness, eh, spiritual nakedness, you are bound to shame, all right? And how would this shame come through? This shame could come through in your steps of faith. You know, people will say, oh, I believed God, but things have not worked. That's shame. Yet God has promised that he will never put you to shame. All right? It's not the will of God for a man to be ashamed. God does not intend to ashamed anybody. All right? And that's the attitude that the Christian also should carry. You should never seek to ashamed anyone. You should never seek to expose anyone. It should never be your life to expose anyone. In spite of who they are and what they do, it never should never be your life. Okay? It's not God's nature. It shouldn't be the nature of a new creation. But you see, Satan has a way of pushing men into a nakedness that puts shame on their lives. So when we're talking about this nakedness, okay, it is the place where you are ashamed either in your walk, you will be consequently, when you see that in a vision, when you dream that, it means that there are things you're going to do that are shameful. There are things that are going to shame you 
as a believer. There are things that are going to expose you to shame as a believer in carnality. Okay? Now, clothing in the spirit realm represents firstly a positioning. Okay? It represents a positioning. Clothing in the spirit realm represents an identity, you know, a sort of thing that separates you to identify you spiritually, okay, but also to define your positioning in the spirit. Okay? So if you dream, for example, that you're naked, or if there's any form of spiritual nakedness, it means that your position in the spirit is jittery. Okay? It is shaky. It means that your identity in the spirit realm is getting tainted. Okay? And some of you who dream those things, it's important to take time and seek God and say, God, what am I missing? Well, if you dream of it touching a person, don't judge them. Don't judge them. Don't judge them. Because that's something that can happen to any believer at any one point in their life of faith. But you pray for them. You know? That may mean that because you dreamt them naked, therefore you're better than them. Okay? No, 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 no. It's not. It's far from that. It's just an event and an affair that reveals, oh, probably this person is being shaken in their positioning in the spirit or their identity. And that can come even when they've not done anything wrong. You know, somebody's position can be shaken because they are persecuted. Somebody's position can be shaken because they look so much to the persecution and not toward God. You know, Satan knows how to break people, okay? But also there are positionings that are shaken or identities that are tainted because of our own doing, you know, our own indifference, eh? especially our own places of carnality. Every time your positioning is shaken and identity is tainted in the spirit realm, it means that there's a questioning on whether you are inclining more to the spirit and toward God, your mind is meditated to the will of God, or you are inclined towards the carnal you know, toward the fleshly nature. And the nakedness in this experience is actually the carnality, okay? The disconnection to their God, to the affairs that you are, you know, supposed to be attending. And if you go back in the Old Testament, for example, when you spoke of, say, the positioning of a priest, a priest had a garment, all right? That was positioning and defined his identity and function spiritually, all right? If you spoke about kings, they had a certain, you know, garment, you know, the things that they would put on themselves or wear, and you know, the crown, oh, this must be a king. Not everybody wore a crown, okay? A certain kind of crown. Not everybody wore a certain kind of, you know, regalia or clothing. There are things that define you and define your positioning. And if you go back through again to prophets, you see men like Elijah, and you see that they have mantles, okay? Prophets would you know, put on mantle. So it's a place of positioning. If you get into a place of marriage, all right, you realize that when a woman becomes a wife, there is something that they are clothed or there is something they put on on their lives. In Exodus 21, verses 10, the Bible speaks of a wife's food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage, okay? The raiment, okay? There is a clothing. There is a covering uh, spiritually. So there are many aspects of these coverings and sometimes even in these dreams okay if you are an ardent seeker you could even seek even God to specify in this nakedness what are we talking about is in the area of me as a minister is in the area of my marriage is in the area of me as my business is it in the area of my career is in the area of my dealings with people what am I dealing with and then as you seek the mind of God when you truly pray he always opens up the only challenge is many people don't know how to pray when they see in the spirit. They don't know how to, you know, seek and wait on God to say, God, what are you uh, speaking to me in the hour? When you read Genesis, and I'll remind you of Adam and Eve in the garden, okay? They ate the forbidden fruit. And when they ate the forbidden fruit, they were killed from a certain vision spiritually and opened to another kind of vision, okay? And in that, their raiment changed. Their raiment changed. If you remember, Adam, they ran off, the Bible says, and they covered themselves with what? With leaves, okay? And when they heard God coming with covers of thick leaves, of course, you'd ask them, one, the two of you have been living naked. There was never a clothing on you. How come in this particular time you are awakened to nakedness? It is because something had taken place in the vision of Adam and Eve. That was the primal effect of the nature. The 
but consciousness uh, to the carnality of Adam and Eve. Their carnality was defined firstly by their awakening, their consciousness. That's the first thing they observed after the fall. They knew, the Bible says, they were naked. They didn't discover. They got a knowledge. They were not just surprised, but they got a certain knowledge that they were naked. That means even earlier, they didn't have raiment. They didn't have clothing on them. They didn't have, you know, garments on them. But there was a glory, okay, that had affected their vision. And in that glory, their vision could not be, you know, tuned to nakedness. It would not yield or even think of nakedness for that hour. But in this instance, because they had fallen, the first, first, first element that exposes the fall from the glorious experience and nature that they carried in the understanding of God to the fallenness of their nature as man was that their eyes were open and they knew that they were naked. They knew they were naked, all right? And the Bible says they sowed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Even before God appeared, they had already met that. Why would Adam be afraid to stand before, you know, Eve? They've been living like that for a long time. But it is because a certain carnality, a certain sensual nature, a certain fleshly predisposition has come in through their lives. And God comes to them, okay? And then they hear the voice of God walking in the garden. And in the cool of the day, another man's wife, the Bible says, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees. So God says, Adam, Adam, where are you? Okay? And the man says, oh, I heard your voice in the garden. He said, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God asked him, who told you that you are naked? Have you eaten of the tree? Who told you that you are naked? Who told you that you are naked? All right? So even when people are teaching about marriage and then we start bringing the conversation of naked and unashamed, some of us teach it from a more carnal perspective, all right? How do you get people with a fallen nature, physical, but also with a regenerated nature, new creation reality, spiritual, okay? And how then do you get the spiritual them and the physical nature of nakedness that comes in the fall and canality of the Adamic, how do you reconcile that nakedness with no shame? You must be able to design that when we're teaching it, because some people teach the realisticness of that statement without understanding the metaphor or the metaphorical interpretation of that scripture. So in tune, sometimes when we end up defining a nakedness in marriage, which actually is spiritual and does not allude to the carnalness and the fallen nature of the Adamic, and yet in the new creation we are actually clothed in Christ, even with our nakedness of the physical, we are clothed in Christ. And people are not supposed to actually be naked spiritually. Okay? So when we're talking about naked and unashamed, we're not teaching marriage in couples, we must know are we talking about the reality of the experience of the carnality and fleshly nature of it, or are we defining the spiritual, all right? How then do we reconcile the spiritual? How does the spiritual override? My point is, if we are talking about nakedness and unashamed in the marriage circles, we must be able, at the end of the day, to communicate the covering of this spiritual garment with which we have in Christ, okay? Not necessarily acceptation of our carnal sense and nature and simply to entertain that carnality all through. I might not have time to explain that, but for those of you who are such as seek, seek out this thing and let's understand it. So when I'm telling people naked and unashamed, we are, yes, saying that it's okay for people to share their weaknesses within each other, all right, but not to ride on those weaknesses as weaknesses to be accepted, but weaknesses to be dealt with so we have better people in marriage than simply saying, you know, accept me in my carnality and simply, no, it's simply the place of understand where I'm at carnally, but let's deal with this to get out from the carnal so we can, by the spirit, we can modify the carnal sense so it can be aligned back to the will of God. But there's a raiment, you know, there's a garment that was off the Adamic. And so 
when he says watch, be watchful and keep your garment, means do not be carnal, right? Deal with everything that would set you into carnality. And then you'll ask me, how do we reconcile this watching? How do I watch? How do I get this thing moving? How do I activate it? How do I make it work? How do I attune myself to being active, to being alert in the spirit, you know, to being responsible in the spirit, to being, you know, like a watchman, to be able to design what is coming and deal with it so I'm not overtaken or that I save my nation, generation, dispensation. How do I connect with that? Should I share with you one of the major ones? There is something that I have come to call the inert pretense of Christianity. All right? The inert pretense of Christianity, the death pretense of Christianity. All right? And you will open with me in Revelation chapter 3, verses 1. The Bible speaks to the angel of the church in Sardis and writes these things. It says, says he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, the Bible says. Okay? He says, I know thy works, that thou has a name, that thou livest and art dead. You have a name that you live, but yet you are dead. Okay? And he tells them, verse 2, be watchful. Okay? The command has come through. And strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. That means they are dying. They are dying in their watchings. They are dying in their watchings. They are dying in their watchings. He says, for I have not found thy works perfect, he says, before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, he has brought back the conversation, I will come on thee as a thief and shall not know what hour I will come upon thee. But verse 4 says, But thou hast a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. They have not yielded into carnality. Right? And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And the fifth verse says, For he that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. That means if you learn to watch, the white raiment would come, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. That's the Christ now in the mind of intercession for the believer of the hour because they have attuned themselves to the watching. Now, let us discuss this inert pretense of the faith. It's somewhere in between the place where the church in Sardis has a reputation that they are alive, but yet they are dead. That's a very dangerous position. The man who knows his place, his true positioning in God, is a man who will make the most pure and honest prayer of the heart. You remember in the Gospels we're given two experiences of the story. One, you know, Pharisee comes and says, I thank God, you know, that I tithe, that I fast, that I'm this and that I'm that. I have this. And he goes on along to blab and, and boast over his achievements, his righteousnesses, his tithings of coming and mint and his fastings and his givings and the righteousnesses as worked through faith. And then on the other side, there is a man who is wretched. He goes to God and tells him, look, God, I'm a sinner. You know, I'm wicked. I am fallen. I carry no grace and glory. Someone look at him. He said, and I need your forgiveness. And God asks himself, who of these men shall be accepted? And gives us the answer. He says, he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. But in what? So there's one guy who's saying, I'm not like those guys that are wicked. I'm not like the slothful tax collectors. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not all this. I'm not like the publicans, the unjust people. I fast twice a week. I do all this stuff. I give my tithes. I do all these things. Okay, so he's looking so much in what he's able to do, his abilities, eh? his strengths, and everything he can do as a man. And on the other side, there is a man who is saying, "Oh, but you know, God, I am not all these things. I believe that these things I'm dealing with, and da 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 da." And of course, to God, the issue of this particular sinner, okay, was because he had examined the true state of his heart. And this Pharisee that is boasting actually had one of the worst 
sins recorded in scripture and that was self-righteousness but he knew it not to know that you have an issue and take it before God is different from thinking you have no issue and so going to God all right with a falsehood in your spirit with a name and a positioning that is not actually yours for the flesh is indeed of Esau but the voice is of Jacob the voices of Jacob that can only happen to a blind father God is not blind God is not blind he sees he sees he sees okay now one of those things that defines so much of our watchings is the true state of where we really are in God if we are weighed by the Spirit of God. When he says, examine yourselves, right? Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. He says, prove your own selves. Okay? And this is a humble heart. How does God you know, help you firstly. He teaches you to humble yourself before him, before his presence, before his person, to be weighed by him in the state of your heart, okay, to be weighed by him spiritually, all right? Because that sort of restores your spiritual compass to know that I'm actually in the right order of the judgments of the Spirit, okay? That's why when the Bible speaks in Thessalonians, the reconciliation of knowledge and judgment, that we might prove the things most excellent. There can never be a proving of the Spirit when knowledge and judgment are not weighed together, all right? And to God, the most pure sense of this is the purity of a man's heart to go before God, not to prove himself as one who is pointing to his own righteousness, but to allow God to deal with him, to prove him, you know, according to the reality of God's truth. So when God teaches you knowledge, when God teaches you his judgments, when you understand to define the judgments of God and the reconciliation, when he says that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in judgment, the foundation is agape, okay? The foundation of agape draws these two, you know, pillars of knowledge and judgment. When the judgments of God are revealed uh, in our spirits and his knowledge is filled in our spirits, then we can prove the things most excellent. But to go without, you know, to prove the things most excellent, we have to deal with you as an individual, to examine yourself and be proved. Because if your judgment is eluded, you will call what is right wrong and you will call wrong what is right. You will judge wrongly what is right and you will judge rightly what is wrong. You will be mixed up. And we have many believers whose compass of their judgment is so off. They are not attuned to true north of the spirit. And so they cannot design a true pastor. They can't design a true apostle. They can't design a true prophet. They cannot design a true teacher. They can't design a true evangelist. They can't design that this is wrong. They cannot design yet what is right and what is wrong. They are still babes. They are unable to discern what is right and wrong. They are still trying to explore. And some of them are so actually in that instance, they are so quick to judge even in what they do not know. Okay? And so what happened to the church in Sardis was a point where they lost God's judgment, for example, in worship. But they carried a very misinformed idea of worship. Okay? And as they continued in doing that, one time they get to an idea of worship that is so off, but they do not know that they no longer worship in church. Okay? And then after that, of course, certain wrong judgments, misinterpretation of knowledge, all right, comes through, and then they start to have a very deceived idea of worship. It's even happening today. It's in the songs that we teach and we sing. It's in the way worship leaders across the world you know, lead their own ministries and do worship. I was born a worshiper. The first major miracles I saw, I saw them during worship. And I speak as a worshiper. That there are many times I have seen people singing and I can tell that they've lost the compass of true worship. And some of you watching me have designed that in many churches. 
all right? So if we lose the true spirit of a worshiper, there's a presence that you're going to disconnect from. And as your conscience fears, you will learn to deal with the absence of that presence. And then provide a deceived idea of what presence you think you will need. And if that evolves over years, before you know it, you meet people. I have watched now on television how people define the presence of God. In the Old Testament, you know, the glory of God would fill the church and the priests were unable to minister today if we don't have ice machines to press them so they can release, you know, a snow kind of thing, you know, dry ice in the crowd. We will not sense his presence. And sometimes you see it on television and we're... When it is released, you hear leaders saying, come on, everybody, just raise your hands right now. The presence of God is here. And some have breathed that in and taken that as presence. But it's the many ways we have lost judgment. It's the many ways we have lost knowledge. People no longer read the Bible for themselves. Today, a preacher, a minister, an acclaimed minister can wrongly, you know, preach or teach a scripture and be so off. And then you see people scream and say, yeah, Rabba Kata. They're screaming and saying, hallelujah. You know, it's so sad. It's so sad. And some have been even in the faith for 10, 15, 20 years, 30 years. Okay? But what has killed their judgments over time? Not to know the heart of God. Because when you don't understand how the judgments of God work, when the Spirit of God is grieving, you can even think He's happy. All right? Because some people think that the justification, okay, on the gifting is the same justification of the heart of the minister. Those two are different. That is why there are people who are gifted on the altar, but there are not many people who are ministers on the altar, who are ministering on the altar. And we all call that ministration because we have not yet judged the difference between gifting and ministration. You can actually operate in a gifting, but yet not minister in the heart of God, with the heart of God. Because the giftings and callings of God are without repentance. Okay? They're not so attuned to mandate and assignment. No, they follow the mandate and the assignment. The mandate and the assignment precedes all of these things. And not many people are able to understand what I'm sharing, but I pray that by God, he will give somebody understanding. What am I trying to tell us here? That we are losing our place of watching because the judgments of the spirit and knowledge have been thrown out of the church and they've been replaced with excitement, okay, with political correctness you know, with liberality, you know, with philosophies, okay, with uh, the pleasings of men, endless myths and mythologies, with, you know, too much education of the world and not the education of the mind according to the pattern and will of God. If that leaves the worship, it goes to the preachers, we ministers of the gospel. Many of us have lost the plot of why we're preaching to people. The Son of God, the Bible says, came to serve and not to be served. Even when men serve us, they only serve us because they see we serve God. Okay? But how many men of God actually have built a life of being served and not serving men? We are not even available for our own people that God has sent us to. All right? We have gotten so selfish in the way we even operate on the altars that it is so much about us than it is about Christ and what he came to do, you know? It's the exploitation of the weak that even this man who is giving on your pulpit, who is seeding on your pulpit, they are not seeding in revelation, but they are seeding in the power of your manipulation because you'd rather manipulate them for them to seed in your ministry than to give them the understanding of why they seed. Or that if you are to give the understanding of the seed, you will frustrate your gimmickry. That's how far we've gone. And I'm not speaking this to judge any man, but I'm only trying to say, the reason why now the world is going through this crisis and they cannot look to the church for answers is because we have grossly misrepresented this message. We've grossly misrepresented the gospel. There are more Christians fighting each other on social media than they are, you know, uh, which doctors fighting Christians anymore or other people fight, fighting Christians. It's, it's a lot. I could say, I could speak endlessly about this, but those of you who have understanding, these things continue and they kill our judgment. They dissuade us from the knowledge which is in God. The thing that disconnects a man from loving the truth and loving to revenge and seek vengeance and, and, and the truth, the Bible says, and because they love not the truth, the Bible says God gave them over. Because they love not the truth. He gave them over. 
And now like the scriptures say, they are deceiving even as they are deceived. But it begins in the agaping of the truth, in the love of the truth. We must love the word. We must love the word. If you are a believer who is watching me and a week can go by when you've not opened your Bible, what are you doing to yourself? You don't set aside time to search the Word of God every morning. What are you doing to yourself? If you have time for television and radio and social media, you can go on Facebook every time, but you do not have time for God. What are you doing to yourself? Okay. How much of the information of the world and the carnal world do you put in yourself every day? versus the information and knowledge that you receive by God every day. How then can you watch when your judgments are misguided and your knowledge is misaligned? You see what I'm saying? And because of that, okay, that pretense, the death pretense comes through. It's not that now we are pretending anymore, but we are even deaf to the Spirit of God that is trying to, you know, taught us to correction and tell us, look, this is the right way to go. I believe that the next move of the church cannot come the way it should when the church is not awakened to the judgments of God and his knowledge of it all. But it has to begin in agape. We have to fall in love with God again. We have to stop pretending to fall in love. We have learned the art of speaking before cameras, of preaching, of singing and weeping and melting affections, of telling people we pray for them, yet we don't pray for them. We've learned the art of appearing to be men, ministers of God, but we have a very hidden life that is not attuned to love, to agape, to the revelation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as long as we continue in that pretense, we cannot watch. Or if we pray, we cannot pray in the right will and purposes of God. And because it becomes selfish, it becomes self-seeking, it becomes self-righteousness, it becomes what we receive in the end, not what Christ has given and sacrificed. The people we are representing back in church history are a cloud of witnesses that have sacrificed and laid their lives for the gospel. Many of those men lost their lives and lost their families, lost all that they had. They counted all things but lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, for whom they've counted all things but dung. The Bible says, but that they might win him that they might be conformed to his death, that they'll fellowship in his suffering, that they'll see resurrection power in his life, and that they might not be found in themselves, but that they might be found in him, having the righteousness which is of him, that which is of the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is by the faith of God. When we're talking about love, some of us, even our definition of love, it's so carnal. It is not defined by God. When agape is a revelation in your spirit, okay, and knowledge and judgment are in your spirit because of the foundation of agape. Everything that touches the heart of God will touch you a certain way. You will not decide to watch. You will find yourself watching because you'll be concerned with the heart of God. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 6, he says, therefore, let us not sleep. He says, as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Because the opposite of that is a sleeping church. The opposite of that is a sleeping Christian. And yes, you can sleep and still have a nice job. You can sleep and still have a nice family. You can sleep and still have children. You can sleep and still have a nice car and say, oh God, praise God, he has given me a car. Right now, we are at a state where even the people who have the most expensive cars cannot drive them out of their homes. Some people with the most expensive houses cannot live in their own houses anymore. There are people right now on ventilators who don't care how much money they have on their account. They are just believing for the next breath. They are living just to breathe in and out. Okay? But as a church of Jesus Christ, we still have a responsibility. I tell people, COVID is still in the world because a larger part of the church is asleep. A larger part of the church is asleep. But when we wake up and truly wake up and understand the heart of God in this and that knowledge is elevated and the judgments of God, 
in proving these things, in fact, the Greek word there of proving, you judge as right, all right? We will be able to speak a voice that can judge disease in one day it's out of the world. But God just doesn't want to take COVID out of the world. He wants that all men be saved and that they might come to the knowledge of the truth. To the knowledge of the truth. This period is a very, very checking time for the body of Christ, for men of God for believers and ministers who have been playing and acting and manipulating and taking advantage and deceiving and drawing images and idols of themselves and not Christ. It's going to be a very testing time. And trust me, watch my words. By the time we come out of this season, many, many ministries are going to be weighed. They're going to be weighed. There's a big part of the world that is so asleep. Of course, those who are not born again are dead. <laughs> you understand? They're not alive. But there's a big chunk of the church that is asleep when we're supposed to be watching. What is God saying in this period? What is our responsibility as a church in this period? Apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors, worshippers, even you, single mother, who doesn't do anything in church, but you know that you are called for a certain responsibility of the hour. It's those things, ladies and gentlemen, that we must be attuned to more than ever before. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. In my heart, prayer, and the person who's watching me right now, our hearts are saved. Connect us to the revelation of agape. May our hearts be attuned to your heart that we will know and judge in every dispensation what you desire of us in the hour. If we do that, then we shall be faithful watchmen. We pray that God will shed off all carnality and that we'll be clothed again with the clothing of Christ. For the Bible says, put you on Christ, that you might be able to withstand your carnalities. So we put on Christ. But we don't just put him on just by thought. We put him on by knowledge. We put him on by your judgments and God raise men and women that will stand posts and under God ministries, that will stand posts and under God nations, that will stand posts and under God continents, that will stand and under God generations, that our altars will be sanctified and consecrated again, that the truth and the gospel come back on the altars like we have never had it before. That all pretense and gimmickry, all, you know, uh, political correctness and worldly liberalities, that all, you know, philosophies and uh, forbidden wisdoms will leave our altar, that Christ in his purity will be preached again on our altar. God, if we see these days come, revival will come, healings will come, deliverance will come, breakthrough will come. We pray, God, that we will not come out of this season as a church the same way we entered it. Because if we do, then it means we never learn to sing. Awake them that sleep, O oh God. Awake us to the responsibility of the hour. And may every man stop to live for him and live for something bigger than them. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. If you're sick in your body, I speak healing. May God heal you. May God deliver you. May God sanctify. May God strengthen and uphold you in your body. In the mighty name of Jesus. And if you have never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity right now to pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. Today, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm born again. If you've made that prayer, you're born again. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at 
Fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest.